Hello everyone and welcome back. Today I am responding to you all's so-called unpopular K-pop opinions. Quick side note before I start the video, I apologize for not posting more frequently. I promise I have a good reason. <laughs> As many of you know, I graduated college about six months ago and I started working full-time recently so my schedule has not been as flexible or free as it has been in past years. But I really want to keep posting on this channel because I like K-pop, I like talking about it, and I like interacting with you all so I'm trying to figure out how I can post minimum twice a month to this channel while still keeping up with my other responsibilities. So please bear with me as I try to figure out my schedule. But anyways, with that aside, today I'm responding to you all's opinions about K-pop in 2023 that you submitted. Fair warning, I will not be responding to every single opinion that was sent in, one, because this video would be hours long, and two, because I only respond to opinions that I myself have an opinion on. So if you sent me an opinion about a group or a topic I either don't care about or know very little about, I probably didn't respond to it. So sorry if you don't hear your opinion read, but that's just how it goes. Uh, but now enough chit chat and let's move on to reading you all's opinions. First opinion is Batter Up was incredibly disappointing as a debut and I was left feeling extremely underwhelmed after the song ended. I saw somebody describe Batter Up as an AI generated Blackpink song and I can't think of a better way to describe it. Maybe Baby Monster will bounce back in the future with a better, more unique sound, but YG thoroughly messed up this debut by going into the Blackpink vault for this group. Like, I feel like we were all kind of expecting Baby Monster to be Blackpink's little sisters, but this was way too on the nose. Blackpink already exists. It's not like anyone was begging for a company to debut a younger version of them. Baby Monster was already going to be fighting an uphill battle, debuting in the shadow of Blackpink, but having both groups have basically an identical sound and concept just made it unnecessarily more difficult for them. Another issue I take with their debut is how outdated the concept is. This debut screams Blackpink, but like, debut Blackpink. This is 2016 to 2017 Girl Crush and it's just not good. And before anyone jumps me, it's not like I expect all groups to be trendy and include all recent trends in their music because I don't, but I don't think anybody was fiending for mid-2010s Girl Crush to make a comeback. Also, I just don't think the members really suit Girl Crush. It's probably because the members are so young, but I do not think this is a group that can pull off a darker concept. Teen Crush would have been way better for them, or maybe a coming of age concept if they really wanted to try something darker, but this is YG so we know they had to do something Girl Crush and hip hop for them. But in my opinion, Girl Crush just doesn't suit any of them. Watching them try to pull off the typical fishnets, combat boots, and acrylic nails style associated with Girl Crush feels like I'm watching a group of girls raid their older sister's closet. It just feels like a wrong fit. I hope that Baby Monster can begin to develop their own sound and style with their first comeback, whenever that may be, but this was just a horrible way to start off the group's career. Next opinion is, when XG say they're X-pop, they're saying it as a concept and as innovators. However, some K-pop stands try to use that statement as a way to shut the girls out of the K-pop industry slash space, which I think is disrespectful to XG. Y'all don't want them to be K-pop because you're all scared. And don't use language or their nationality as an excuse, i.e. they sing only in English or they're all Japanese. Everyone who complains about young ages and or minors in K-pop should stand on business and support groups like Kiss of Life or Vivis. Okay, so to respond to the first part of your opinion, I've never understood the outrage some K-pop stands have at XG for promoting like a K-pop group. Maybe I'm jumping the gun, but it feels slightly xenophobic because every time I see somebody make this complaint about them, it always circles back to the fact that they're Japanese. Which is such a weird hang-up to have because there are so many non-Korean idols in K-pop. Baby Monster, who I just mentioned, is primarily composed of non-Koreans. Practically half of TWICE isn't Korean either. In fact, only a handful of the popular groups in the industry right now consist of an all-Korean lineup. I don't understand why people suddenly care about whether or not the idols they stand are Korean when it comes to XG like that's ever mattered before, especially to international K-pop stands. 
It's not like idols from Japan make worse idols. And to respond to the second part of your opinion, I don't know how the term quote unquote grown women in K-pop got twisted to mean anyone over the age of 17 because the oldest member of Kiss of Life is like 23. When people talk about wanting to see more grown women in K-pop, we mean women in their late 20s slash early 30s not college students. If the year they're born in starts with 2000, they're not grown women yet. <laughs> Next opinion is, I think La Seraphim's discography is one of the best in fourth gen, Korean and Japanese, dare I say zero skips. Members also contribute to it with Yoonjin having credits to all their albums, great variety from dance music to softer tracks. I somewhat disagree with this. While I like their music for the most part, I sort of feel like La Seraphim don't really have a musical direction. I feel like the main appeal I'm always hearing about their music is that Yoonjin or the other members had a hand in writing the music, and that seriously doesn't do much for me. I've said it before, but idols writing their own music is not an indicator of the music being good. And that's not to say that La Seraphim's discography sucks or anything, but using the fact that their songs are written by the members as the selling point really means nothing to me because it doesn't make the music itself inherently good by being written by a member of the group. But back to the main point. I kind of felt this way when the Anti-Fragile mini album was released. I just didn't really understand where they were going as a group, and the release of Unforgiven really solidified this opinion for me. Unforgiven, while not a bad song, can best be described as non-committal and aimless in my opinion. And I feel like I'm not the only one with this opinion because I've seen more than a few people describe Unforgiven as feeling somewhat incomplete. The concept had a Wild West thing going that didn't fully pan out, which still bothers me, and the chorus of the song completely takes me out of the hard-hitting, bass-heavy pre-chorus. The cheerful chanting of the chorus sort of feels like they didn't really know where to take the song and just hoped that the lyrics would fill the role of hyping up the listener instead of the melody. As for the concept, it feels like they gathered what scraps were left from Anti-Fragile and cobbled it together to create the concept in combination with the Wild West elements. The song feels like a lackluster attempt to ride the coattails of the success of Anti-Fragile down to the titling of the song Unforgiven. The title track in the album confirmed for me that it doesn't really seem like La Seraphim or their creative label really knows what they're going to do next. They wanted something heavy hitting and powerful like Anti-Fragile, but it just didn't come naturally to them and so they tried and failed to make pieces fit. And while Perfect Night was cute and catchy, it doesn't do much to ease my anxiety about La Seraphim's musical direction. The uncertainty I feel about where they're headed as a group bugs me. Which is weird because to a certain extent, I like uncertainty, seeing as one of two of my alt groups is Red Velvet. But then again, La Seraphim isn't Red Velvet. They're not a no concept concept group the same way Red Velvet is. And for that reason, there's just something about their current discography that makes me feel like they don't really know where they're going. I feel like this sounds mean or like a slight to La Seraphim, but it genuinely isn't meant to be. They have so much potential as a group and I could see them doing so many things which is what makes me nervous because that potential right now is floating around out there randomly and hasn't really been honed and refined just yet in my opinion. For the most part their music is good but I feel like right now it's sort of luck of the draw. Unforgiven kind of proved that they themselves aren't really sure of where to go next. It's like good and not so good tracks are getting pulled out of a hat at random. Hopefully their next comeback changes my mind and we get a solid feel for what type of sounding concept La Seraphim has, but I just don't trust that we'll consistently receive good music from them right now. Next opinion is, now that they are becoming more common, K-pop stands don't understand the purpose of a pre-release single. They always say it's just a b-side, it's okay if it doesn't do well, when it is very important. And some K-pop companies don't know how to execute and make the most of a pre-release. I agree and disagree with this. And I'm so glad you brought this up because I have a very personal problem with pre-release singles. Pre-release singles nowadays are excessive. Everyone has one, no one knows how to use it. To me within K-pop, it's just a b-side that either overshadows the comeback or gets no attention. If companies want to properly execute a pre-release, they should be releasing these songs weeks or even months before the comeback. 
Pre-releases are meant to build anticipation for a future release, so I don't understand why they get dropped seconds before the comeback, which only serves to create this weird competition between the pre-release and the title track. It feels excessive. New Jeans did it with Ditto and OMG, and I've did it with Kitsch and I Am. Both groups dropped the pre-release just two weeks before their comeback, and it made for weird competition on the charts and the title track being somewhat overshadowed by the pre-release. That's not to say that these releases were unsuccessful because of the pre-release because they weren't, but why have two songs released by the same group just days apart fighting for the number one spot? It doesn't make any sense. Why are companies not giving people time to digest the pre-release before giving their group a comeback? Like I get wanting to ride the excitement from the pre-release into the comeback, but two weeks just feels too soon. A month or two is a perfect amount of time for people to get to enjoy the pre-release and get excited about the comeback. There's no need to bombard fans with music. I feel like I sound so old right now, but having a pre-release and then having a comeback right on the heels of that is just so overwhelming to me. Let's pace ourselves and take a breather after we get excited about the pre-release song so we can be fully devoted to the comeback, you know? Also, pre-releases should really encapsulate the concept and overall sound for the comeback. Don't just throw any old b-side out and make it the pre-release. Next opinion is telling idols that singing in English is pandering is racist. I'll explain quickly. You are, number one, telling someone that in order to be authentic to their ethnicity, they cannot step outside of certain parameters. And two, you then define those parameters for them. You are racist with a large serving of colonizer vibes. You are wrong. Deadass. I 100% agree with this. There are a certain group of K-pop stands who are obsessed with measuring an idol's quote-unquote Koreanness and authenticity based on what language they sing in, which is inherently problematic. Idols do not shed their Korean identity like a snakeskin by deciding to sing in English, implying otherwise is extremely racist. If you want to talk about the creative and musical blunders that K-pop groups end up making sometimes when it comes to singing in English, such as poor lyricism or stagnant concepts, that's different. But a lot of you have reached the point where you are dictating what language idols can sing in and accuse them of quote unquote becoming westernized. Which is confusing to me because as I've stated in videos before, K-pop has always been westernized. There's never been a period since K-pop's inception where K-pop has been exclusively based on Eastern culture. And this unspoken consensus that people with this opinion seem to have about maintaining the so-called Koreanness and Easternness of K-pop to the point where they get genuinely upset if idols sing in English is bordering on fetish territory. Especially considering that these criticisms rarely ever come from Korean people. For example, BTS is the main victim of the critique that they're losing their Korean identity by singing in English. However, Koreans fucking love their English releases. Dynamite and Butter were hits. Nobody except for international fans were debating whether or not BTS was losing touch with their Korean and roots, and that should tell you something. I think that there is something to be said about the hit music and concepts take when it comes to a K-pop group deciding to release a song in English, but that's a conversation for another day. But debating a group's Korean identity over English releases and dictating what language they should sing in because of their ethnicity is racist, point blank. Next opinion is, the problem Orbitz had with Luna switching to Girl Crush in 2019 that most people don't seem to understand was the fact that Luna threw feminine concepts like Hi Hi, more cutesy, and Butterfly, more elegant but still feminine. They were one of the few actually empowering girl groups at the time, if not the only one, and even in today's climate. Back at the time, most girl groups were just doing Girl Crush and were labeled feminist just because of the corny lyrics they sang and edgy styling. Meanwhile, Luna showed that even by embracing your femininity, you can be an actual feminist and uplift women voices. Not to talk about the decline in music quality despite still having one of the best discographies in K-pop. I disagree with this. From my memory of that time, a lot of people were dissatisfied with Luna kind of going down the boy group rabbit hole. People, myself included, were not happy with the change in sound because it felt noisy and disjointed. This change up had a lot to do with Jade and Jung no longer working with Luna. While I dislike him, it's undeniable that Jade and Jung was the real force behind Luna's earlier sound and once he left, their sound changed. I think if he hadn't left, people would have more positive feelings towards Luna's later body of work, and the shift from Butterfly to So What wouldn't have been as sharp 
or at the very least it would have been handled better. It had more to do with the drastic change in sound than the concept. I feel like it was always somewhat expected that Luna would dabble with Girl Crush, and I never really considered them a particularly feminine group the way I perceive a group like Twice, for example. I think it just didn't have that signature flair people had come to expect from Luna since Butterfly, which is why a lot of people perceive their later music to be such a steep downhill from their pre-debut and rookie releases. Next opinion is, children should have the freedom to debut. What if it is their dream to become idols? I'm so done. Stop being so dirty minded. You don't know what's going on in these companies. You don't work there. Stop assuming things. What if children see this? There will be so many heartbroken. I think if that's what they want to clearly do with their dreams and they should go right ahead, but if their parents are pushing them to debut, then that's messed up. Completely disagree. There are too many idols who debuted as children who have said that they regretted it for me to ever get behind children debuting as idols. Hiana, Yeri, Boa, Taemin, IU, etc. have all talked about how much they struggled as children in the industry. There are so few protections in place for idols as adults. How do you think it is for children in the industry? Also, I had a lot of dreams when I was a child and I am thankful to my lovely parents every day that they did not cave to those desires. <laughs> a child wanting to be an idol doesn't mean that they're entitled to become one. Kids want a lot of things they don't realize aren't good for them. It's not a crime not to let a child debut as an idol even if they really want it. The only reason people push for children to debut is because of the emphasis that's placed on youth in the K-pop industry. There's seriously no good reason to debut a 14 or 15 year old. Train a few more years and debut when you're an adult. They'll be better prepared and better equipped to deal with the demands of being an idol when they're 18 or 19 years old and will have improved talent-wise significantly. I have yet to hear a coherent reason why children should be allowed in the industry and frankly, I don't think I ever will. Next opinion is, Twice had a great year. Moonlight Sunrise was a smash, Jiho Zone was absolutely incredible, self-written too, and Do Not Touch is definitely one of the best Japanese title tracks of the year, if not the best. They also had a hugely successful tour, broke the K-pop girl group record for highest first week sales in the US, and made history as the first K-pop girl group to be honored at the Billboard Women in Music Awards, and yet all anyone wants to talk about is how Set Me Free flopped, set me free from that conversation. I unfortunately disagree. People focus on Set Me Free because TWICE is a K-pop group, and Korean comebacks are the meat and potatoes of their activities. And its success, or lack thereof, represents the bigger picture. The failure of Set Me Free to gain any traction domestically further proves the point that a lot of people, myself included, have been making, which is that TWICE is no longer keeping the attention of the Korean GP. And I know people are going to bring up how Korean once has boycotted the comeback, but the decline of their digitals has been evident for years now, and it can't exclusively be blamed on K once's for not streaming. And even more surprising, Surprisingly, Set Me Free was not popular with international fans either, and that's odd considering if Twice's comebacks don't do well domestically, they at least do well with international fans. And the tour, sales, and Billboard Awards are intra-fandom achievements, meaning that these accolades don't really matter outside of their core fan base. Non-fans aren't going to care about their first week sales in the US, all they know is that TWICE did not have a memorable comeback this year, which is rare for them. And getting to Jihyo solo, that also failed to impress in terms of charts, especially domestically. Realistically, unless you were a once or actively keeping up with them during the year, a lot of TWICE's activities went under the radar. Moonlight Sunrise was probably their most popular song released this year, but even still, it wasn't a comeback, and compared to Twice's other release, it underperformed. Twice just kind of kept to themselves in 2023, intentionally or not. Next opinion is, K-pop stands don't know shit about rap, and I will never take none of them serious when it comes to conversations regarding rap. Like most didn't listen to rap prior to K-pop, yet you expect me to take your judgment serious when it comes to rap skills. Like I've seen how some K-popies have tried to downplay and discredit J. Cole so they can praise their nigga boo. Like I'm not taking y'all serious. And before somebody gets mad at me for saying the n-word, I am black, so cool it. But yeah, I stopped taking K-pop stands' opinions on rap seriously a long time ago, especially when a lot of you openly admitted you didn't like rap before getting into K-pop, which still blows my mind. You all standards for what is good rapping is low, like really low. So yeah, I don't think K-pop stands have any leg like to stand on when discussing or critiquing rap, especially if you're not black. And the last opinion is, the way JYP has been handling Leah's hiatus isn't sitting right with me. 
Like with Jungyun and Mina, even though they didn't participate in stages, variety shows, and award shows, they were still in the MV, sang on the album, and were in concept photos. But with Leah, it's like she doesn't exist anymore. Not in the MV, not on the album, not in the concept photos, nothing. And they're gonna go on a world tour. It feels kind of mean to do all this important stuff without her. It feels like since Leah has been Itzy's punching bag since day one, JYP is seeing if people will like Itzy without her. IDK, I'm probably just worrying over nothing, but you never know what kind of BS agencies try to pull. I agree. The way she's been practically non-existent this comeback with the exception of her solo song is worrying. I get that they can always just squeeze her back in wherever she'll fit if she returns to the group eventually, but at the same time, this comeback seemed like there was no room for Leah in it anywhere. The fact that she's not in the MV or in the concept photos bothers me because like you said, even when the members of TWICE were on hiatus, they still managed to include them in comebacks, at least on paper. Maybe we're just getting ahead of ourselves, but I don't like how JYP has been handling her absence and it really sort of feels like ITZY is preparing to continue as a four member group. I hope I'm wrong though. Anyways, that's it for this video. Thank you to everyone who sent in opinions. I'm sorry if I didn't read yours, but for obvious reasons, I can't respond to every opinion that was sent to me but thank you all again for watching and i will see you in my next video bye